Let me see, inoxorably. Pauline quaked. Suppose the skirt of the gray dress showed when she lifted her arms. Well, go then, with a long sigh. If I ain't here when you come back, remember that I want to be laid out in my lace shawl and my black satin slippers and see that my hair is crimped. Do you feel any worse, Ma? The poplin dress had made Pauline's conscience very sensitive. If you do, I'll not go. And waste the money for them shoes. Course you're going, and mind you don't slide down the banister. But at this the worm turned. Ma, do you think I would? You did at Nancy Parker's wedding. Thirty-five years ago. Do you think I would do it now? It's time you were off. What are you jabbering here for? Do you want to miss your train? Pauline hurried away, and Anne sighed with relief. She had been afraid that old Mrs. Gibson had, at the last moment, been taken with a fiendish impulse to detain Pauline until the train was gone. Now for a little peace, said Mrs. Gibson. This house is in an awful condition of untidiness, Miss Shirley. I hope you realize it ain't always so. Pauline hasn't known which end of her was up these last few days. Will you please set that vase an inch or so to the left? No, move it back again. That lampshade is crooked. Well, that's a little straighter. But that blind is an inch lower than the other. I wish you'd fix it. Anne unluckily gave the blind too energetic a twist. It escaped her fingers and went whizzing to the top. Ah, uh, now you see, said Mrs. Gibson. Anne didn't see, but she adjusted the blind meticulously. And now wouldn't you like me to make you a nice cup of tea, Mrs. Gibson? I do need something. I'm clean wore out with all this worry and fuss. My stomach seems to be dropping out of me, said Mrs. Gibson pathetically. Can you make a decent cup of tea? I'd soon as drink mud as the tea some folks make. Marilla Cuthbert taught me how to make tea. You'll see. But first I'm going to wheel you out to the porch so that you can enjoy the sunshine. I ain't been out on the porch for years, objected Mrs. Gibson. Oh, it's so lovely today. It can't hurt you. I want you to see the crab tree in bloom. You can't see it unless you go out, and the wind is south today, so you'll get the clover scent from Norman Johnson's field. I'll bring you your tea, and we'll drink it together, and then I'll get my embroidery, and we'll sit there and criticize everybody who passes. I don't hold with criticizing people, said Mrs. Gibson virtuously. It ain't Christian. Would you mind telling me if that is all your own hair? Every bit, laughed Anne. Pity it's red. The red hair seems to be getting popular now. I sort of like your laugh. That nervous giggle of poor Pauline's gets on my nerves. Well, if I've got to get out, I suppose I've got to. I'll likely catch my death of cold, but the responsibility is yours, Miss Shirley. Remember, I'm 80. Every day of it. Though I hear old Davy Ackman has been telling all around Summerside I'm only 79. His mother was a Watt. The Watts are always jealous. Anne moved the wheelchair deftly out and proved that she had a knack of arranging pillows. Soon after, she brought out the tea and Mrs. Gibson deigned approval. Yes, this is drinkable, Miss Shirley. Ah, me, for one year I had to live entirely on liquids. They never thought I'd pull through. I often think it might have been better if I hadn't. Is that the crab tree you were raving about? Yes, isn't it lovely? So white against that deep blue sky. It ain't poetical was Mrs. Gibson's sole comment, but she became rather mellow after two cups of tea and the forenoon wore away until it was time to think of dinner. I'll go in and get it ready, and then I'll bring it out here on a little table. No, you won't, miss. No crazy monkey shines like that for me. People would think it awful queer us eating out here in public. I ain't denying it's kind of nice out here, though the smell of clover always makes me kind of squalmish. And the forenoon's passed awful quick to what it mostly does. But I ain't eaten my dinner out of doors for anyone. I ain't a gypsy. Mind you wash your hands clean before you cook the dinner. My Miss Story must be expecting more company. She's got all the spare room bedclothes airing out on the line. It ain't real hospitality. Just a desire for sensation. Her mother was a Carrie. 
The dinner Anne produced pleased even Mrs. Gibson. I didn't think any one who wrote for the papers could cook. But of course, Marilla Cuthbert brought you up. Her mother was a Johnson. I suppose Pauline will eat herself sick at that wedding. She don't know when she's had enough, just like her father. I've seen him gorge on strawberries when he knew he'd be doubled up with pain an hour afterwards. Did I ever show you his picture, Miss Shirley? Well, go to the spare room and bring it down. You'll find it under the bed. Mind you, don't go prying into drawers while you're up there. But take a peep and see if there's any dust curls under the bureau. I don't trust Pauline. Ah, oh, yes, that's him. His mother was a walker. There's no men like that nowadays. This is a degenerate age, Miss Shirley. Homer said the same thing 800 years B.C., smiled Anne. Some of them Old Testament writers was always croaking said Mrs. Gibson. I dare say you're shocked to hear me say so, Miss Shirley, but my husband was very broad in his views. I hear you're engaged to a medical student. Medical students mostly drink. I believe, have to, to stand the dissecting room. Never marry a man who drinks, Miss Shirley, nor one who ain't a good provider. Thistle down and moonshine ain't much to live on, I can tell you. Mind you clean the sink and rinse the dish towels. I can't abide greasy dish towels. I suppose you have to feed the dog. He's too fat now, but Pauline just stuffs him. Sometimes I think I'll have to get rid of him. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Mrs. Gibson. There's always burglaries, you know, and your house is so lonely off here by itself. You really do need protection. Oh, well, have it your own way. I'd rather do anything than argue with people, especially when I've had such a queer throbbing in the back of my neck. I suppose it means I'm going to have a stroke. You need your nap. When you've had it, you'll feel better. I'll tuck you up and lower your chair. Would you like to go out on the porch for your nap? Sleeping in public. That would be worse than eating. You do have the queerest ideas. You just fix me up right here in the sitting room and draw the blinds down and shut the door to keep the flies out. I dare say you'd like a quiet spell yourself. Your tongue's been going pretty steady. Mrs. Gibson had a good long nap, but woke up in a bad humor. She would not let Anne wheel her out onto the porch again. Want me to catch my death in the night air, I suppose, she grumbled, although it was only five o'clock. Nothing suited her. The drink Anne brought her was too cold. The next one wasn't cold enough. Of course, anything would do for her. Where was the dog? Misbehaving, no doubt. Her back ached. Her knees ached. Her head ached. Her breastbone ached. Nobody sympathized with her. Nobody knew what she went through. Her chair was too high. Her chair was too low. She wanted a shawl for her shoulders and an afghan for her knees and a cushion for her feet. And would Miss Shirley see where that awful draught was coming from? She could do with a cup of tea, but she didn't want to be any trouble to anyone, and she would soon be at rest in her grave. Maybe they might appreciate her when she was gone. Be the day short or be the day long, at last it weareth to evening song. There were moments when Anne thought it never would, but it did. Sunset came, and Mrs. Gibson began to wonder why Pauline wasn't coming. Twilight came, still no Pauline. Night and moonshine, and no Pauline. I knew it, said Mrs. Gibson cryptically. You know she can't come till Mr. Gregor comes, and he's generally the last dog hung, soothed Anne. Won't you let me put you to bed, Mrs. Gibson? You're tired. I know it's a bit of a strain having a stranger around instead of someone you're accustomed to. The little puckery lines about Mrs. Gibson's mouth deepened obstinately. I'm not going to bed till that girl comes home. But if you're so anxious to be gone, go. I can stay alone or die alone. At half past nine, Mrs. Gibson decided that Jim Gregor was not coming home till Monday. Nobody could ever depend on Jim Gregor to stay in the same mind 24 hours. And he thinks it's wrong to travel on Sunday, even to come home. He's on your school board, ain't he? What do you really think of him and his opinions on education? Anne went wicked. After all, she had endured a good deal at Mrs. Gibson's hands that day. I think he's a psychological anachronism. 
she answered gravely. Mrs. Gibson did not bat an eyelash. I agree with you, she said, but she pretended to go to sleep after that.